Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the course on uh, medical biomaterials. Hello everyone, we will uh, continue on the historical perspective of biomaterials. As I mentioned in the previous class, we have uh, biomaterials made up of synthetic materials, um, it could be metals, it could be polymers, it could be ceramics, it could be semiconductor material and uh, there could be blends of all these. In addition, we also have uh, natural materials. Uh, nowadays, uh, quite a lot of interest is being shown on natural biopolymers which are produced by bacteria or from the plant source. Um, so, let us look at history of biomaterials. Uh, this dates back to al almost uh, 2000 or three, even 3000 years back. The Chinese, the Romans, the Indians used uh, gold, uh, silver uh, and mercury in uh, dentistry. They used to have different type of uh, teeth, you know even wood teeth, ivory teeth and so on actually. Okay. And then uh, aseptic surgery was even uh, practiced uh, almost about uh, 120, 50 years back and uh, after a, a fracture even bone plates were implanted as early as 1900. Okay. Then in the year of 20th uh, uh, century AD, synthetic polymers were started being used in uh, biomaterials. Okay. Then uh, polymethyl methacrylate was uh, getting popular, one of the most popular polymers uh, because uh, it was used in the World War II and hence um, uh, they were also used in biomaterials. Uh, another material which was, which another polymer which was very popular was polyester because polyester was used in uh, many um, industrial applications as well as in uh, everyday clothing. So, that also went into the biomaterials. Then in the 60s, polyethylene started coming into um, sometimes combination of metals coated with polymers. So, that especially in hip joints, one could have better uh, uh, you know, flow properties, one could have better moving properties especially in the joints. Okay. So, the biomaterial could be thought of as four stages or four generations the very, very early biomaterial, the general feeling um, was the material has to be inert. It should not cause any um, adverse reaction to the host, that is all. So, the whole goal was looking at material which were completely inert. The second generation of uh, biomaterials was that material should be active. That means, uh, the, the host system should be able to respond to the material and the material should be conducive to the host system. So, the second generation of biomaterials which came around 80s were thought of in terms of bioactivity. The third generation of biomaterial uh, looking at regenerating functional tissues, okay, that was the third generation of biomaterials using nano composites, nanomaterials and so on. And the fourth generation of biomaterials, they started thinking in terms of tissue engineering. That means, can I make uh, different types of tissues um, outside in the lab and bring it in and use it inside. Okay. Can uh, the tissues grow or cells grow um, on top of these biomaterials uh, without uh, differentiating as a uh, foreign body. So, that is how the evolution of biomaterials started and that is how the thinking with respect to the biomaterials usage and research also started actually. So, if you look at uh, this particular uh, um, a figure, it nicely gives you an idea. So, the first generation I would say of biomaterials, we are talking in terms of inert materials, the second generation of bioactive materials, bioresorbable. That means, material which will completely dissolve or get absorbed and the third uh, was bioactive and bioresorbable biomaterials. Um, involving nano composites and hybrid materials. Okay, the fourth was biomimetic biomaterials that means like uh, engineered scaffolds and so on. That is how um, the biomaterials started coming and as you can see it is hardly 80 year old research it started from 1950s going right up to 2000, 
20s and 30s. Although biomaterial was used as I showed you in the previous slide as old as Chinese and Indians and Romans, um, but that was more of an ad hoc and it was just practiced. So, in the first generation of biomaterials, um, they were talking about stainless steel, okay, titanium alloys and so on which was very inert. It never caused any adverse reaction to the uh, host. The second generation, um, they started using bioceramics, they started using polymeric material, hydroxyapatite, okay, uh, then polymer, polymers like uh, polycaprolactone, then polylactic acid, collagen, polylactic glycolic acid and so on. Okay. The third generation involved a lot of nano composites, it was hybrid combinations of uh, polymers and metals combinations of ceramics and metals and so on actually right. So, hydroxyapatite, polylactic acid uh, and so on. The fourth generation where we want tissues to grow on the material um, so that it does not differentiate um, whether it is the host natural system or a um, synthetic system. So, we had nano hydroxyapatite, collagen, cellular biological molecules like proteins, okay, immunomodulators okay growth factors. So, the tissues um, started growing on that. Okay. So, a lot of research is being done on tissue engineering and uh, developing scaffolds which will allow tissues to grow, differentiate and then the scaffold may completely um, get uh, bio res um, absorbed. So, the scaffold will completely disappear. So, this is the historical perspective of biomaterial I would say um, over the past uh, 80 to 100 years. So, the first generation uh, ad hoc implants, so the physicians uh, used common material which are found around them or borrowed materials from engineering disciplines. Um, so, it was more like accidental rather than design like gold fillings like mercury or silver, wooden teeth, polymethyl methacrylate. So, a lot of these natural materials were used glass eyes um, when the eyes got uh, destroyed due to accident or due to growth. Dacron, Dacron uh, like polyesters, parachute cloth, they were all used in vascular implants. So, they were more of accident rather than by design. Okay. If you go to second generation, it is engineered. So, there is a collaboration between the physician and the medical practitioner. So, the medical practitioner would say what type of materials are desired. So, the physician and um, the, uh, the engineers would uh, modify certain structures so that we get the properties. So, there was a lot of advanced material science research being done like use of uh, titanium alloy, orthopedic implants, cobalt chromium molybdenum type of orthopedic implants, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene surfaces, heart valves. So, all these came under the second generation where there was a lot of collaboration between the uh, physicians and the engineers. For example, if you look at this heart valve, okay, so it has got a titanium cobalt alloy and then um, ring here titanium cobalt alloy and here you have a poly uh, okay, uh, terephthalate and PTFE polytetrafluoroethylene. So, it is a combination of two materials and they were all engineered so that they will do their purpose. Or if you look at uh, pure titanium cages, these are used for long bone segmental defect. So, if the uh, bones have defects more than 2 inches, um, then uh, you cannot just uh, hope that it will cure by itself. So, they have to uh, do some other ways and these are called long bone segmental defect and titanium cages are used uh, to address this type of long bone segmental defect. If you look at uh, this, uh, this is a polytetrafluoroethylene vascular graft. These are small diameter vascular grafts. Um, if the vascular that is about 1 mm or something like that 1.5 mm, if you add 2 mm or 2.5 mm, we can use PTFE or we can use even polyesters. PTFEs are uh, um, very, very inert um, and uh, they can also be nicely designed for diameter of interest. Okay. Now, if you look at third generation, they are bioengineered implants using bioengineered materials like nano composites, like using nano oxides, uh, nano polymers in drug delivery, okay, they, they releases the drug in, nan, in the nanoscale material and then it gets completely. Um, biodegraded or novel blends like combination of synthetic and biopolymers or metal and polymers, metal and biopolymers. So, combinations of uh, many of these. These are very much engineered and uh, uh, bioengineered materials 
ok. So, they are mostly nano scale, uh, so they had good interaction with the host system. When you go to the fourth generation, uh, the general feeling is to have biomimetic material. This is an important uh, word you will come across in biomaterials, biomimetic. It is designed with specific structure and function mimicking the biological molecules, ok. So, um, in the human system you are supposed to be having proteins, you, you have uh, many enzymes, you have peptides, growth factors. So, the biomaterial you are designing should be mimicking these complex biological molecules and they should provide the structure function infrastructure. They act, act as a matrix or a base for the cells to grow um, they also get involved in biological signaling. That means, you sometimes uh, um, include uh, signaling molecules uh, which are slowly released, uh, inflammatory molecules which are slowly released, so that certain actions take place ok. So, you can uh, help in delivering proteins, we can uh, use it for gene therapy, you can use it for drug delivery and so on actually. So, four generation biomaterials are of recent origin and I think uh, the biomaterial research is going in that direction. These are tissue engineered implants designed to regrow rather than replace tissues, uh, artificial skins uh, um, being looked at by this particular company, uh, looking at cell cartilage procedure, looking at bone repair cements, they are re resorbable bone repair cement, ok. Genetically engineered biological components. Uh, are being researched by these uh, companies. So, these are called the fourth generation biomaterials, they are biomimetics that means they mimic the actual um, body part either in the form of uh, acting as um, support or acting as a matrix for the cells to grow, sometimes uh, giving out uh, biological signals sometimes giving out proteins, genes, drugs and so on. And finally, it may completely bioresorb and disappear ok. These are called the four generation biomaterials ok. If you look at polymeric biomaterials, uh, many polymers are used as biomaterials and many of them are approved by the FDA polymethyl methacrylate, polyvinyl uh, PVC, um, polyvinyl chloride, PLA, polylactic acid, polyglycolic acid, P, polyester. PP polypropylene, PA polyacetate, polytetrafluoroethylene, polyester, okay, um, polyurethane, silicones, all these are biomaterials which are used in different parts of the body and uh, many of them have been approved by the FDA. Um, what are the advantages? They are easy to make, uh, even complicated items could be made, uh, we can make it so that we can tailor the physical and mechanical property. So, I want a very soft material, I can use a polymer, I want to have a very hard material, I want to have a very strong material like polycarbonate. So, we can nicely tailor, we can do nice surface modification uh, so that the material is biocompatible with the host system, the material does not cause adverse reaction with the plasma proteins, um, we can help um, the material. Uh, as a scaffold for immobilizing cells, it can be made biodegradable. If you want to have a biodegradable drug delivery system or if you want to have a biodegradable scaffold, you have to go for polymeric material. But what are the disadvantages? Leachable, sometimes the unreacted monomers may leach out, sometimes if it is a blend of 2-3 polymers, some polymers may leach out which may be toxic ok. There is a, uh, you might be knowing polycarbonate. Um, is made up of uh, bisphenol A and uh, diphenyl carbonate and sometimes this bisphenol A leaches out which is known to have an endocrine disordering property. So, there is a worry about polycarbonate. If you take polymethyl methacrylate which is widely used in dental, uh, acrylic acid which may be in, in the order of ppm or even very much smaller than that may be leaching out very slowly which could be toxic. So, that is one disadvantage. They can absorb water and proteins and sometimes it is taken as advantage, sometimes it is taken as a disadvantage because they may absorb and they may swell which is good in some way because it has the water carrying purpose. Sometimes surface contamination can happen um, while handling oil or other material contamination. They can wear easily unlike metals, they can break down 
because of uh, UV or other gamma rays, they can biodegrade which is in advantage as well as which is dis disadvantage. Suppose I am using a ultra high molecular weight polyethylene um, in joints, I do not want it to biodegrade. Whereas, if I am using a stent, biodegradable stent, I want to degrade. So, this is advantage as well as disadvantage. Difficult to sterilize, um, there are different sterilization procedures uh, which have to be ad adopted before the material is placed inside the body. Some polymers um, cannot withstand certain conditions, so we will talk about it later as time goes on. Ceramics, they are oxides like alumina, zirconia, silicate glass, calcium phosphate, calcium carbonate, calcium sulphate, the hydroxyapatite. So, there is a lot of interest in ceramics because many of our body um, like bone contain lot of uh, hydroxyapatite. So, they are extremely biocompatible and they are bioresorbable. So, there is more lot of interest in bioceramics. Uh, disadvantage and advantages are there. Ceramics high compression strength, um, they have good wear and corrosion resistance, can be polished, they are very bioactive and bio inert. So, the advantage is um, the system easily adapts, the host system easily adapts to this. They have high modulus, so they do not match with the bone, they do not have any tensile tension, so it, they easily snap. So, we cannot use it in such situations they have low fracture toughness, it is difficult to fabricate, you know, so you have to be very, very careful about that when you are designing. So, it has got some advantages and disadvantages. Metallic biomaterials, stainless steel 316, cobalt chromium, titanium aluminum, silver, gold, copper, palladium alloys, amalgam, all of them with different amounts of mercury, nickel, titanium, titanium. So, a lot of metals are being used as biomaterials nowadays in different parts of the body. Um, high strength, okay, good fatigue strength, resistance, good wear resistance, easy fabrication. We can fabricate nicely and the technology for metals has been there for almost 200 years. So, that is the advantage. Easy to sterilize, we can uh, heat it up to very high temperature and bring it down. So, nothing will happen to metals. Shape memory, we can even design material which retains its original shape. Okay. And these are advantages. High modulus is a big problem. Okay. These materials are very strong. So, if I am going to use it uh, um, in place of a bone, um, when you compare the strength, the modular strength of the bone and the metal, um, there is a mismatch. Okay. Corrosion is a problem because uh, uh, stainless steel can get corroded over a long period of time. Uh, many metals can get corroded. Metal ion sensitivity and toxicity, slow leaching of uh, metals is a big problem. Um, even if it could be in the order of a part per billion, uh, some uh, patients uh, may be allergic to metal toxicity. Metallic looking, um, you will always, suppose I put metals in the teeth, in the oral cavity, uh, then you, the metal look does not, uh, is not very aesthetic. So, there we may have to go to polymeric type of uh, biomaterials. Okay. So, uh, many advantages, disadvantages of various materials. So, if you look at polymer, we have, we are going to spend a lot of time later. We have natural polymers, we have synthetic polymers, natural could be pro proteins like collagen, fibrogen, soy protein, whereas uh, um, so, uh, you also have polysaccharides like hyaluronic acid, cellulose, chitin and so on, um, glucans. If you got a synthetic material, we have non-degradable and degradable. Non-degradable is like your polypropylene, polyethylene, polyacetate, polyurethane, polycarbonate, PVC, PMMA. Degradable, um, you can have PGA, PLA, um, polycaprolactone, okay, polylactic acid, okay, polyhydroxybutyrate, um, and then even. Uh, um, aliphatic polyesters, so they all degrade nicely. So, advantages, disadvantages, they have sustainable production. So, we can uh, uh, manufacture them nicely uh, using uh, petroleum based uh, um, raw materials, they are biodegradable okay, and they are biotech compatible. So, a lot of advantages. Okay. Uh, if you look at biopolymers, uh, there are quite a lot of biopolymers, uh, polysaccharide based biopolymers, protein based. Uh, then we have the synthetic uh, semi bio derived monomers, so polylactic acid, then produced by organism, 
polyhydroxyapatite, um, then you have the glucon based bacterial cellulose. So, we have uh, extracted from biomass obtained from bio derived monomers or produced by organism. So, a huge number of biopolymers are now slowly coming um, they can be nicely tailored when I say tailored we can change the molecular weight um, if it is a bacterial bio based biopolymer by modifying the fermentation condition we should be able to tailor make uh, the molecular weight of the polymer. We can blend it with synthetic polymer to achieve uh, the desired properties because biopolymers might not have the desired um, strength. So, we can use a synthetic polymer um, in addition to achieve the desired strength and we will be able to use it for uh, making different biomaterials of different uh, size and shape. Okay. So, that is the advantage of uh, bio based uh, material. Okay. Um, so, huge number of uh, opportunities are there especially for one to do research on bio based material um, either animal origin, either uh, plant based origin um, okay, or uh, monomers which are derived from biological uh, raw materials. Okay. So, there is a lot of interest in bio based uh, polymer systems. Um, you need to do surface modification of uh, any material so that uh, uh, it becomes uh, biocompatible, uh, it does not cause any toxicity the host system. So, the material should not uh, be bioreactive um, and so on. We will spend more time later. Uh, so, there are many physical and mechanical approaches for doing the surface modification even chemical treatment method. For example, um, if uh, uh, I want to make it very hydrophilic, I want to put in lot of hydroxy groups. So, I can modify the surface of a polymer to put more hydroxy group. Okay. For example, if it is too hydrophilic, I want to make it hydrophobic, I may reduce the um, hydroxyl groups that are present. If it is very, um, okay, if there are too many positive charge, if it is very cationic, I want to make it neutral. I can put functional groups so that the charges are getting neutralized. So, a lot of chemical treatment approaches are there for surface. Then biological treatment, I can even uh, immobilize cells, I can immobilize protein, peptides. So, the surface becomes more biomimetic, surface becomes more biocompatible. So, a lot of uh, work uh, research possibilities are there, especially in the area of modifying the surfaces using biological. I can seed cells so that bacterial contamination does not happen. Okay. I can have uh, um, some growth factors immobilized on the surface of the polymer so that uh, and the surface acts as a very good scaffold for uh, growing cells. So, uh, again um, uh, various uh, opportunities are there uh, for looking at uh, surface modification of uh, materials um, either through physical, mechanical, chemical or biological method. There is a lot of interest nowadays on biological surface modification techniques. Oh, so, surface properties of material when I say surface properties, uh, surface is either hydrophilic or hydrophobic, surface is either uh, uh, ionic or neutral. Okay, so, we can look at surface charges, we can look at the surface morphology, uh, we can look at uh, um, whether the surface has pores, okay, whether we can look at what type of functional groups are present on the surfaces. So, different types of uh, uh, surface properties are available, uh, we can use different instruments, we will talk about uh, instrumental approaches later on, um, how to look at surfaces, how to look at charges on surfaces, how to look at surface morphologies and uh, all those we will be looking at as time goes on. Uh, so, the materials of course, deteriorate with time, materials deteriorate um, because presence of lot of enzymes in the um, a lot of uh, body fluids that are present, materials deteriorate because where it is located inside the body, uh, bacterial contamination, bacterial growth, um, release of uh, certain toxic material by the bacteria, all these can lead to deterioration of uh, biomaterials. When we talk about deterioration, it is degradation, leaching out of uh, um, monomers, uh, leaching out of uh, stabilizers and so on. Uh, if you are talking about metals, then of course, we are going to have corrosion, uh, polymers can have degradation, sometimes you can have calcification, uh, in addition we can have oxidation, reduction, amidation. 
so many types of reactions are possible because body contains lot of uh, enzymes and proteins which can lead to these type of uh, um, chemical reactions or biochemical reactions. Then uh, we are having to have mechanical loading especially um, if it is a uh, replacement of a bone, long bone segments or replacement of different uh, um, joints then we are going to have mechanical loading, mechanical wear and tear, um, leaching of uh, uh, certain metals from uh, these uh, joints ok. So, all those things are also possible that also leads to deterioration and failure of the biomaterial ok. Then uh, uh, we can also have uh, these combined or combinations of all these effects actually. So, there could be a slight deterioration. So, a coating which is uh, present on a metal to prevent uh, certain corrosion gets removed. So, the metal will start getting corroded over a period of time. So, you are talking in terms of uh, combinations of uh, deteriorations. We will talk about each one of them a little bit later on in detail also actually ok. Um, so, when how do we select materials? It is uh, there is no single answer ok uh, in selecting because as I said some biomaterials are placed um, in the urinary region, some materials are placed in the blood region, some materials are placed as heart valve where they actively move um, continuously. So, some materials are uh, like your urinary catheter are placed for only few hours whereas, if you look at cardiovascular stents they are placed for many many years. If you are looking at uh, uh, joints they will they are supposed to last for the entire life. So, if fact time factor comes in, uh, mechanical loading factor comes in, the location in the body comes in. So, there is no single answer for selecting a biomaterial. So, depending upon the application and duration we need to have different criteria. So, we need to consider mechanical properties, we need to consider chemical properties, uh, what type of uh, biological effects that may take place because we do not want any biological um, reactions taking place. Do they we have to consider carcinogenicity, toxicity, is there any allergic reaction. Uh, for example, a chromium plate uh, might not cause allergy to some uh, patients whereas, uh, the chromium may cause allergic reaction to some other patient ok. Is there any immunology, immunological effects? How do you fabricate? Is it easy to fabricate? How do you process the material? Is it easy to sterilize ok? Uh, can we make hundreds of uh, biomaterial? Oh, there is a spelling mistake here it should be a good. So, can we keep on manufacturing in large scale with reproducible properties? So, all these also needs to be considered because ultimately we are talking in terms of manufacturing and selling it and then of course, cost benefit is a very very important we have to consider uh, is it cheap or it is very expensive. See uh, for Indian scenario we have to consider how expensive is the biomaterial ok. Um, because um, India is a poor country and it is not so easy for everybody to afford uh, biomaterials which are very expensive unless you have say uh, medical insurance. So, for example, your imported cardiovascular stent may cost a uh, couple of lakhs which uh, drug eluding cardiovascular stent whereas, uh, your um, ordinary bare metal stent may cost one and a half lakhs whereas, if it is manufactured by in India it may be much less. So, the physicians have to give all the options to the patients so that they can select the biomaterial based on the cost benefit analysis. So, this goes for many of the products imported products may be expensive, Indian products may be cheaper. Indian products uh, um, have equally good benefits um, and that needs to be explained to the patients by the um, physician so that the patient can make a cost benefit analysis. Uh, some of the joints um, hip joints may last much much longer several years, but it may be very expensive whereas, uh, there could be some hip joints which are cheaper uh, which uh, life may not be as much as those expensive ones. Um, so, patients who do not have an active life can manage with those type of hip joints. So, the 
we need to uh, really educate the patient of uh, different types of possibilities that are available, what are the cost of each one of them and uh, um, what type of situations are suitable for each one of the product. So, I think that sort of uh, knowledge has to be imparted to the patient so that they can make a good uh, selection based on many factors. So, these are some of the criteria for material selection. Okay. So, material properties if you look um, it is huge compressive strength, tensile strength, bending strength. Of course, uh, these properties are not necessary if you are going to have a passive biomaterial like uh, um, okay, catheter or something, but these properties become important when you are talking about hip joint or uh, um, bone replacement or even your heart valve. Coefficient of thermal expansion, if there are going to be any changes in the thermal coefficient of thermal conductivity, surface tension, hardness, density hydrophilic, hydrophobic uh, properties, water resorption, uh, um, swelling, solubility, surface friction, creep, bonding properties. So, all these are very, very important which needs to be considered. Uh, bonding comes in if you, when we are having two or different types of materials combined together. Okay, so, I have a ceramic um, combined um, with a polymer or a polymer with the metal especially in your hip joint. So, there has to be a good bond between these two. So, in such situations we will have bonding properties to be considered. So, all these properties um, need not be considered for all biomaterials. So, we will be pro taking properties which are very specific for particular type of biomaterials and the application. Okay. Um, so, uh, one needs to consider also what is the interaction with the cells or the tissues with the biomaterial. Okay. Um, so many factors we need to consider as we go along and um, it gets very complicated and complicated because uh, the biomaterial has to be implanted and placed inside the body for a, either a short period of time or for a very long period of time. Okay. Thank you very much uh, and we will continue in the next class.